Good morning. Welcome to Scottsdale Christian Church. Please stand and worship with us. Higher, you are the only king forever. 
us from the pitfall. He is mighty. Thank you. 
Father God, we come before you and we are so thankful for your love. So great is the love that you have lavished on us that we could be called your children. And God, in this world, there's so much sin. There's so much trial. There's so much devastation. God, sometimes it turns us into dry bones and dead hearts. But you are a God of life and a God of salvation and you come to us in our hour of need. And God, I pray that... This world is so needy, and that we realize that you are the answer to our problems. I pray that we turn to you so that you could breathe in us, that we could live again, that we could live strong and live for you. God, I thank you for Jesus, who gave it all for us to take away our sin. And I pray that we will give it all back to you each and every moment. God, as we go through this worship service, Please accept our praise. Accept our worship. May it come from worthy lives. And God, I pray that as the message is spoken, that you will give us ears to hear what it is that you have for us. We know your word is truth. And we will live our lives conforming to your word. God, give us the love for the world that you have. Help us to go out and reach each and every corner. Help us to seek the lost and the lonely. Help us to raise them up, to give them hope, because we have a God who saves. And God, in each and everything that we do in this service, may it be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. We thank you for Jesus, and we pray these things in his name. Amen. Amen. Then seize my soul. My Savior God to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art, and sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee, how great Thou art. Oh Lord my God, when I am lost of wonder, consider all the wounds my hands have made. I see the stars.
Amen, amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you for leading us into worship of our great God. That is awesome. Well, I'm glad you're here this morning. Uh, it's good to be back. I went to Mexico City last week. We'll give you some details about stuff that happened there. Uh, but for this morning, uh, we're starting a new series, and it's called In the Beginning. And we're doing just three weeks uh, about parts of the book of Genesis. And to be honest, I'm going to mess with your minds a little bit, okay? Um, the, the stuff I'm going to be teaching this week and next week is just going gonna, gonna to go contrary to probably most stuff that you've been brought up with, but I need you to be perceptive. I need you to be a, a little bit open-minded because I know some of this stuff is going to just, it's going to rock your world a little bit, okay? Um, and so I, I, just to kind of get us into that mindset of thing, seeing some things differently, I've got a picture of this elephant here. And I just want you to look at this picture. I want you to think and see what, what it looks like. Does this elephant have four legs or does it have five? It kind of depends on how you look at it, doesn't it? It's kind of a funky little picture. All right, well, okay, so the next picture is this. It's, it's of this guy on land uh, on a desert island and a guy stuck in a boat. Okay, so, so who's happier here? The guy that's stuck on the island? It's like, finally, a boat's coming to get me. Or the dude that's been in a boat for who knows how long, uh, looking for land, a place to sit, all right? The, the picture there just kind of really depends on what you're looking for, which guy is going to be happiest, right? Third picture. Two guys coming up the sidewalk. They see this letter on the ground. Is it an M or is it a W? They're looking at the exact same picture, and they're seeing a totally different letter. And it totally depends. Uh, sometimes you just need a bigger perspective. If you're someone from the outside looking down at this, you look at the context and see, is that an M for Main Street or is it a W for West? Or what else? It, only from looking at the bigger context can you really get an idea of what the real letter is. Truth is there. It's hard for either one of these guys to see because they're so wrapped up in it and they need to get a bigger perspective. Does that make sense? Well, we're asking the question today, how did we get here? As human beings, where did we come from? And I'll tell you what, there's a lot of evidence to show where we came from, and there's two main ways that you can look at that evidence. 
The same process that we saw there, we're going to be using here. There are two, two conclusions. Number one, there is a secular scientist who says, he looks at the evidence and says, um, here's what I think happened. Second, there's a creation scientist who looks at the same evidence and says, well, you know what? I think we got here in a different way. See, they come to their conclusions based on their belief system. The secular scientist believes that there is no God, that the universe has always existed, and we evolved from other species. The creation scientist believes that there is a God. He created the universe, and he created us. Okay? So we're going to look at some evidence today, look at it from the two different perspectives, and you see kind of where we get to these. The first evidence we'll look at is evidence of the fossil record. Evidence of the fossil record. Fossils, fossils, you can go out in different places, especially in Arizona, and you can dig in the ground at certain places and dig up fossils, old bones, right? Fossils of other things, but primarily bones is what we're concerned about. Fossils happen, they don't just happen easily, okay? If you walk out in the desert and die, okay, just keel over because, you know, it's too hot or whatever, um, and we just let you die out there and just let you lay, you're not going to fossilize, Okay, the birds, the critters, they're all going to eat you up, and they're just not going to leave a bunch of bones behind. Okay, kind of nasty, but it's cheaper than burial. So, um, <laughs> fossils happen. I'm not promoting that. I'm just saying. Um, fossils happen primarily because of floods. When floods happen, things get covered very quickly in mudslides and stuff like that. That's primarily how fossils are created. Although sometimes volcanoes erupt and cover stuff very quickly in mud, uh, that does happen. And occasionally, very occasionally, like amber from tree things, if you've seen Jurassic Park, insects get caught up in amber or something like that, very occasionally. The primary way that fossils happen is because water floods, mudslides happen, and cover things. Here's an example to show you how quickly fossils are formed. This, fit, this is a fossil of a fish eating a fish. That's how quickly fossils have, they have to, living creatures die, and they have to be covered so quickly. This dude's eating his lunch, <laughs> dies and is buried. I mean, what a way to go. <clears throat> so... Throughout the world, we have millions of fossils, potentially billions, but only 0.01% are land animals. A huge, overwhelming majority of the fossils are uh, like sea creatures, like minor organisms in the animal kingdom, okay? So the, most of them are sea creatures. Most of the animals, most of the land animals we find are found in the Cambrian layer of rocks, Okay, the, in the Cambrian layer of rocks, it's known as the Cambrian explosion. Because if you go out and start digging down, uh, I think we have a picture of the Cambrian explosion. <clears throat> and so what happens if you dig down layers and layers of, of dirt, what you're going to find is there's layer of layer of layer of dirt, right? Go to the Grand Canyon, you see the different layers, right? Makes sense. Um, and the, what happens is in all the bottom layers, you really don't see much in the way of animals. But in the Cambrian layer which is the second layer from the bottom, the kind of the light purplish color. At that layer, all of a sudden, you see this explosion of animals. Where before there's almost nothing, all of a sudden, all these animals in their form that we see today are in the Cambrian layer of rocks. It's called the Cambrian explosion because they just suddenly appear, okay? Um, we find those fossils in the ground and uh, Basically, um, in the different layers, the, the different layers is called the geologic column, okay? The geologic column just shows you that millions of years ago, you know, it, it just shows you the, the most basic life form is down here, and the further up the layers you go, the more complex the life forms, okay? Pretty simple, right? So, a secular scientist look at, looks at the geologic column, and because he believes in uniformitarianism, What's that? <laughs> Uniformitarianism. I learned this in high school, so that was kind of cool to be able to pull this out all from that long ago. Uniformitarianism just says the natural processes in the world, the rain, the dust, the wind, all those things, they go on exactly the same as they always have. 
So the secular scientist, that's his belief system. The processes have always been the same because they believe that because the universe has just always existed. So he or she will look at the natural processes of the earth. They'll see how quickly the dirt layers form today. They'll take a measurement, however they do that, of how the, the dirt layers form today and say, okay, well, if it takes this long to get this many inches of dirt, well, then let's extrapolate back through the layers and go, okay, now we get a, an earth of billions of years old because everything has gone on exactly the same for millions and billions of years. And so when you see the, the form like this, what you see is the basic creatures were here first, and then as you go up the layers, they evolved into different creatures getting to where we are today. Creation scientists believe in catastrophism. Catastrophism just means catastrophe. There's some big event that reshaped the earth. There's a, um, man, we see them all the time right now, the fires in California, the hurricanes in Florida, the floods in Houston. There's some type of catastrophe that, that shaped the earth. And the reason they believe that in, in cat catastrophism is because they believe in God, and they believe in God's word. In Genesis 6, um, it, it tells you a little story about what happened on earth a long time ago. Genesis 6.11 says this, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. Down in verse 17. I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. And we'll get into this more in a couple weeks. But basically God said, hey, people are evil, wicked. They're corrupt and they're violent. I need to start over. I'm going to flood out the earth. And when you read through, I don't want to give away too much from a couple of weeks, but, but we, we hear about the Noah's flood. Uh, you know, we think it's 40 days and 40 nights. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. The earth was flooded for a year. The entire earth over the highest mountain peaks for a year. If you have that much water on the earth, it's going to reshape a few things. And so a creation scientist will go, okay, I believe that the Bible's true. If the Bible's true, there was a huge flood. If there was a huge flood, that it totally changes the way we look at all these things. Because of that flood, animals would have been buried in mudslides, right? And so for a creation scientist, he looks at the geologic column and says, okay, well, the basic, basic you know, the very low life forms, <laughs> they didn't know a flood was coming. <laughs> so they just got buried in mud. The smarter animals, when the flood water started going, they said, well, this isn't good. Let's head to higher ground. And so they were buried at higher levels. Make sense? So the geologic column just shows that the smarter animals were able to make it further up the place when they were buried. <clears throat> so you have this thing. You have fossils. You have the geologic column where all of a sudden, uh, from a creation point, guess what? In the Cambrian explosion, it's not that animals are just there. All of a sudden, it's that a flood came and buried those animals at that layer. And then other layers were just deposited on top of them. Why do I believe in catastrophism? Because, number one, I believe that the Bible is God's word. God was there. He was the eyewitness to all these things in history. He had Moses write it down. Think about this also. Other evidence for a flood, if you do a little research, you'll see that almost every major civilization throughout the entire world in its history has some story of a flood. Do you ever think about that? Where did this story that every person on earth has, has heard of in some fashion, where did this story come from if it didn't happen somewhere in the past? Every major nation throughout the world has some type of a flood story. Evidence of the fossil record. Depends on how you look at it. Depends on your belief system going in. Do you believe that the earth has always been around? The universe has existed for millions and billions of years and it's uniformitarian just kind of going? 
Or do you believe in what the Bible says about a, a worldwide flood? Second piece of evidence to look at. Second piece is evidence of similarities in structure. I, I, that's the best I could do. I'm sorry. Uh, evidence of se- similarities in structure. What that means is uh, there's a scientific term called homology. And homology just says this. There is a similarity in structure of creatures. Uh, I think we have a, a picture of, of some of these things. Of, of a person, uh, a dolphin, a whale, a horse, I think. And what, what you look at in, in the different bone structures, it, they say it's homologous. It's similar. Meaning that there's a main big bone, a big arm bone. There's a, a couple smaller bones. There's the wrist bones. And when you look at the different bone structures, if you remember this from science a long time ago, the, they, they have a similarity in structure. Now, the bones may be different sizes. They may be slightly different shapes, but it seems to be kind of in the same the order for a whole lot. Now, a secular scientist believes in evolution. So they look at this evidence, and they say that these creatures have a common ancestor. They say that there was way back when there was an animal that was the main one, and from that animal, it branched out into different creatures like whales and people and horses and such. And because of that, they have a common ancestor. A creation scientist looks at the same bones, believes from the Bible that God made the animals. He looks at the evidence and says, these creatures have a common designer. They have the same type of maker, the same maker for the whole thing. And the reason they believe that is in Genesis 1, starting with verse 20. And during the creation week, it says this. It says, God said, let the water teem with living creatures. And let birds fly above the earth and across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing with, with which the water teems and that moves about in it according to their kinds. And every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds. The livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind, and it was so. A creation scientist would look at what the Bible says about this and say, you know what? God created the birds, he created the the, the animals, the horses, the whales, the dolphins, all those things. He made all those, and because he knew the environment that they needed to be in, he knew what design worked best for those creatures to survive and thrive in their environments, then he made them all similar. Different because different environments, but he made them with a sibilant structure because he's the common designer behind all those things. Why do I believe the common designer? Well, the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that God created all those animals, the birds, the fish, the animals. And here's a crazy thing. Even secular scientists don't think today that homology is proof of evolution. David Welk is an evolutionary biologist. In 1999, he said homology is not evidence of evolution. So one of the things that I was taught in high school, in my high school biology book, uh, I had that picture there, and I was told in high school that that is proof that evolution is true, that they have a common ancestor. But the modern scientists, uh, secular scientists of today are saying, it's not a good argument for it. Interesting how science changes over the years. Third piece of evidence that that we'll deal with this morning uh, is evidence of the progression of man. Now, you may not know a lot about uh, evolution or things like that, but you've all seen this picture, right? You've seen a picture that looks similar to this. And it's evidence of how uh, there were apes and chimps, and they kind of grew and got better and better and better till we have modern day man today. Now, a secular scientist sees a progression of mankind descended from apes. Um, because they look at the, the fossil records, they look at, at just what makes sense there, and they say, you know, we have obviously progressed from apes. A creation scientist sees man and sees man fully formed with Adam and Eve. If you remember back in Genesis 1, starting with verse 27, not only did God make the sea creatures and the land creatures, but in Genesis 1:27, it says, so God created mankind in his own image. 
In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea uh, and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the, earth, on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will, they will be yours for food. And if you read more of the creation story there about what happens after God made Adam and Eve, uh, Adam had a job to do. He had to take care of the garden. He had to name the animals. And so the, the Bible says that the first people were able to work. They were able to talk. They were able to reason they were able to make things. They were able to choose between right and wrong. They were able to do name the animals. They were able to do a lot of different things. Why do I believe that God created man? Well, the Bible says that the Bible says that God created a man who was able to walk, reason, talk, choose. What about cavemen? I mean, I, I've seen the bones. You know, what, what about cavemen? Well, let's deal with cavemen for a second. In, in 1912, there was a huge scientific discovery. It was called Piltdown Man. And it was supposed to be the missing link between the chimps and us. And in 1912, they came out with the skeleton of Piltdown Man. What they found out later is it was a fraud. Some dude decided to uh, take part of a human skull and match it with part of an orangutan skull. Uh, he mixed some pieces up together, filed off some edges, and he just made it up. Many years later, people figured it out and said, wait, that was just that was a mistake. Okay, but for 20, 30, 40 years, people believed that Piltdown Man was the missing link between apes and people. It happened again in 1924, Nebraska Man. Nebraska Man was the latest and greatest link between apes and people. You know what they found for Nebraska Man? What they based the whole thing on? A pig's tooth. You, I'm really not making that up. A pig's tooth was the foundation for the whole thing. It was a hoax that someone perpetrated. But, but I've seen pictures. I mean, the, the picture we just saw. Well, you have to remember this. All we find is bones, okay? We find bones. The pictures that you see, that's just an artist's representation based on the bones that we found. Like when you think of Neanderthal man, we have a picture, okay? You, you see this, but that's a drawing. That's what an artist thinks. That's their interpretation of what the fossils look like, okay? Look today... At, at an aborigine in Australia. That's a picture of a guy that lives in Australia in our modern area. If you looked at the, at the skulls of both of those, and you, you'd probably go, wow, the similarities in these skulls are, are incredibly similar. And so you would think, wow, this must have evolved from here. But honestly, one is just a drawing. One is like, you know what? The pictures that you see of some of those bones are pictures that could be real life today. I mean, if you don't think Aborigine guy is, is, is a good example, well, you can always use Arnold. Uh, <laughs> if anyone looks like the Enderthal man, that'd be him. But we know he's able to terminate you if you get an attitude, so you better watch out. The point is that, is that, that all we found is bones. And just because some bones look a little bit different doesn't mean that they're a different species. Because those are just, as a matter of fact, did you know that with Neanderthal man bones, we have found things like, uh, we know that they were hunters. We knew that they did very modern day burials of their dead, that they were making jewelry. Those are pretty complex things. Those things are found when the Neanderthal men, though those people where they've been buried, just because we call them Neanderthal, just because they may have lived in caves, doesn't mean they were stupid. There are people all over the world today that live in caves. If you go to Australia, it's so crazy hot in the middle of the continent, there's a whole group of people that lives in caves because it's cooler. Cro-Magnon man is, a, is supposed to be a different group of man. They, with them, with the places that we found their fossils, we know that they did basket weaving. We know they did jewelry. We know that they did iron sculpture. 
So not only were they able to create a sculpture, but they were able to use iron to do it. They were able to shape metal to make that happen. Homo erectus is, is another supposedly layer. They were able to make boats that could travel on the ocean. Just because Tom Hanks got on a raft for his movie doesn't mean it's a really successful way okay, to get across an ocean. You have to have some pretty nice intelligence to create boats that will go on the ocean. And then here's the crazy thing. Secular scientists in the field, in this field, say this. Clark Howell, an evolutionary biologist from Berkeley, so hardly at all <laughs> someone who's on the creation scientist side. It, Clark Howell said this, there is no encompassing theory of human evolution. Alas, there never really has been. This picture that we have looks really cool. And when you see that picture of the growth up to a human, you go, my goodness, they wouldn't just make this stuff up. There's got to be reasoning behind all the stage of this picture. There really isn't. One of the secular scientists has said there is no encompassing theory to get us from here to here. They're believing this because they already have a belief system that the universe has always been here, that we happen by chance, and it's been around for millions and billions of years. I know this is a lot, and I know some of you guys just think I'm nuts. I get that. I understand. The very first times I heard some of this stuff, I thought, the dude's nuts. Okay? So I really, really, if you think I'm crazy, will you just, just have a little honesty? Will you take a little bit of time and do a little bit of research on this side of things? Will you take just a little bit of time to look into some of these thoughts and let you know that I'm just not that wacky preacher dude, okay? Three places that you can go to check out some stuff, okay? Number one, uh, there's a, uh, a TV show, is Genesis History. Is Genesis History. You can either write these down or get your phone out and take a picture of these three things, all right? Is Genesis History. It's a TV uh, thing. There's the, I think it's on Netflix, so you can pull it off there, and it, it will give you some more details about what we just got done talking about. Number two, uh, there's a movie coming out November 13th called Genesis History. Paradise Lost. It's going to be in movie theaters for one day only. We're going to be buying tickets. I know, it's not convenient. I didn't produce the movie. Okay, I have no control over how it's being distributed. I'm just saying, on that Monday, November 3rd, I I'm 95% sure it's a Monday, yeah. Genesis Paradise Lost will be in theaters near here. We're going to buy, buy some tickets. If you're interested, talk to Tom. If you don't know who Tom is, he's the dude waving his hand right here. Um, there's information there. If you can't make either one of those things, then go to this website, answersingenesis.org. Answersingenesis.org. And I'll tell you what, there is more information than you can digest in a month. Okay? Because they're looking at the evidence that we have in all of creation. They're looking at it from a different perspective and one that you've probably never been taught. And they do it all from the, the idea that the Bible is true. The Bible is true. So, if you think I'm a wacko, that's fine. Think I'm a wacko. I'm okay with that. People have thought much worse things of me than that, okay? But do some research on your own. Check some of this out. If you really think I'm crazy, then prove me wrong, please. Let's have a conversation. Um, next week, just a little pro, uh, preview. Next week, we'll deal with dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are cool. Dinosaurs are fun. There's a reason that dinosaur movies do really well in the box office. We all love dinosaurs. So if you think it's going to be, if you, if you have friends and you say, you know, we're talking about dinosaurs next week. So if you want to see a dude just go crazy, invite your friends and you can mock me next week. Okay. When we do dinosaurs. So now why all this? Why are we having this conversation? Why are we dealing with this? Because how we got here as human beings, how we are here today is incredibly important. It's one of the most important things that we can talk about. Because if we just happen by chance, 
If the, the, the rocks collided at the right angle, and if the electricity hit the water at, at the right time, and if the proteins came together in the right way, and then the, the right fish popped up on the land at the right time, and, and, and that whole series of incredibly improbable coincidences, if those all lined up, and we are here just because we just got lucky. If we got lucky, well then what's the point? If we all just happen by chance, just randomness in the universe, then when you die, there's nothing to look forward to. There is nothing. And if there's nothing to look forward to in the future, then it doesn't matter what we do right now. Eat, drink, and be merry. Do whatever you want, because there's nothing afterwards. But, but, if someone made us, if we are here on purpose, then that changes everything. Because if there's a God who created us, we should want to know who that God is. What's he like? Does he expect anything from me? How do I communicate with this being? Do I have to make him happy? Is he going to just, you know, zap me out of here? What do I need to do? Why in the world would he go to all the trouble to make me on this world as improbable as it would be? Is there a future? You see why it's a really important question to deal with? And the way that you answer that question has eternal consequences. Because either you live, you breathe, you die, you're done. Or you live, you breathe, you live for God, and you die, and you spend forever with him. And he's provided that way for us. He's provided that way through his son, Jesus Christ. And that's why we're here. And that's why we want to share these things. So, over the next couple of weeks, we hope to answer some of these questions and we hope to mess with your mind a little bit. Because how we get here is very important. And if you believe what, what the Bible says, if you believe that God put us here for a reason, don't you want to figure out what that reason is? Don't you want to know the God who made you? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you so much that you've given us your word where we can look into these things. You've given us your creation so that we can know that you're there. And God, I pray that you will help us to see, to see the story of the origins of life from your perspective. I know that we're not taught that in schools today. I know that we're not taught it anywhere else. But God, the people in this room we're seeking, we're seeking the truth, we're seeking you. Give us wisdom, give us discernment this week as we search into these things. Work in our lives and work in us so that we can know you, the joy that goes with knowing you and your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name I pray. Amen.
sing of who you are. Love to sing in the name of. Love to sing of who you are. Cause death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin. Pass down the aisle, and you can take a cracker and a cup of juice and pass the tray along to the next person. When God does something, he tends to have a reason for it. He created rainbows, not just because they're pretty, but as a symbol that of his promise to never flood the entire earth again. Another thing God did was to create our souls, put them into bodies, and put those bodies on this earth. So what was his reason for that? Well, it's pretty simple. He wanted a relationship with us. But you can't force someone to love you. That's, that's not how that works. He could have made us in such a way that we would always praise him, never disobey him, basically be the perfect, but that's not true love. True love is a choice. And so God gave us a choice. Either we could bear the punishment of our sins and be forever separated from him, or we could let Jesus, who willingly sacrificed himself, bear them instead, and by doing so, spend eternity with God in heaven. And it's to remember that sacrifice that we take communion each week. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the wonderful love that you've shown us and even when we don't show it back but thank you for sending your son down to us in Jesus name Amen. please stand and sing with us
God bless you. See you in 15 minutes.